Nick Britton. And Nick will be talking about two types of rare collectibles. First one is, of course, course reached credentials, which are <laughs> always something we like to collect. And the second one is bourbon. So I'm excited for both those topics. Welcome, Nick. Thank you for sharing your time with us today. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Leslie. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And hopefully you can see the presentation. Looks awesome. Perfect. All right. Well, welcome, everyone. And, and thanks for sticking around kind of late in the afternoon to hear a bit about the things that I collect, uh, breach credentials and bourbon. And before we get started, you know, have to thank Leslie and the PancakeCon crew. Um, it's been absolutely top notch. You know, all the preparation, everything that goes into a conference, especially virtual, um, you know, you can't say enough great things about what's happening here. And, you know, I think I've heard a few people say in the Slack just how much they're enjoying the second part of people's talks, because some of this stuff is, you know, not things you get to talk about at conferences. And, you know, Griffin Payne, who I worked with, presented earlier on things that I didn't even know he was passionate about. And so this is, I think, the coolest format I've ever seen. And I'm super excited to be able to present today. So before we jump in uh, to the topic at hand, a little bit about me. So my name is Nick Britton. I go by Nerbies on Twitter, um, Slack, you know, several of the other social media sites. Uh, my credentials, I have my OSCP, my OSWP, my CISSP, a bunch of things that end in P. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm really a red team novice still. I've been in the industry about a decade. Um, but I spend most of my time on phone calls these days and Zoom meetings. Um, I'm the practice development lead for a firm called Protivity, which means I talk with my clients mostly about what they want out of a pen testing program and whether they're building it in-house or having us help with those types of things. Um, most of my work these days is theoretical. Um, I'm a health and fitness enthusiast. I love working out. And the, the uh, keynote talk this morning was really amazing. You know, listening to somebody else that's kind of in my area, that's a power lifter and is, you know, doing some of the same things that I've always done and had no idea that there were others in InfoSec that were so interested in that. And then last but not least, um, I'm a collector of things. I, you're going to hear a lot about the stuff behind me, bourbon, obviously, um, breach credentials, and, you know, I'm a normal person. So obviously I have a, a shelf full of old cables that I can't get rid of. My house just seems to accumulate things. And I, you know, I've always kind of been a collector of, of different things, even as a kid. So we'll start off with breach credentials and my journey to becoming a hoarder of flat text files. So first you may or may not know kind of what this topic is about, breach credentials, right? So have you ever gotten an email like this? You know, something from, <laughs> I just got from Google about a month ago, change your compromised password. Google found some of your passwords online. And you kind of make this face in the corner and say, you know, what, like, what do you mean you found some of my passwords online? How, how is the company doing this? What are they looking at? What is a, you know, what is a password doing kind of floating around out there? And how did they tie it back to me? Or maybe you've seen these types of headlines, you know, and this is all from about a month ago, um, a new breach compilation called the Compilation of Many Breaches or COMB, C-O-M-B. And this is a large, you know, a large collection of breached credentials, about 3.2 billion records that's just floating around the dark web and now the clear web. And so what are these things? So these breach credentials lists have been floating around for a number of years. And I really started tracking this around January of 2019. Um, essentially, they are flat text files with username and password pairs that have been accumulated from past um, corporate breaches or you know, websites that have unintentionally leaked data. And around 2019, I started seeing um, some news coming out from sites like Troy Hunt's Have I Been Pwned um, and Krebs on Security talking about these compilations that attackers or threat actors were putting together of all these previous breaches and um, how attackers were starting to use these things to be more targeted in the way that they conduct password guessing attacks. And so collection one um, in January, 2019 was really kind of my force, first foray into trying to download one of these. Then I'll talk about how I did that. But since then I've, I've continued to track the news and track these being released and have continued to download um, and query these things, both for 
kind of my personal joy and for, you know, things that I do at work. And, you know, it's, it's awesome to be able to go to a client kind of show and tell this um, as an example of why, you know, passwords are not always, you know, a great security control. So I mentioned, you know, first of all, what, what are these things, these breach credentials list? If you've never gotten your hands on one of these, this is the directory structure that you're typically looking at. They come in a, a compressed file that when you decompress, um, it's a directory structure by letter and by number. And this is the first character of that password. And it's, um, you know, it's several levels deep uh, because there's so many of these uh, text files and, you know, 3.2 billion records that it has to be um, fairly embedded. And there's several directories in this tree to be able to fit all these text files into a single compressed folder. And then when you actually look at some of these files, and I'm just tailing a specific uh, file here under the n slash o directory, it's quite literally just a collection of email addresses and associated passwords for those accounts that have been seen somewhere out on the internet. And so that's great, right? Cool. So you got a text file, you got a bunch of old usernames and passwords that we think might be valid. Who knows? Some are from 10, 20 years ago from breaches, from random sites that, you know, people may not use anymore. So kind of why, right? Why does it matter? And a single attack really got me interested in this kind of username and credential list collection and querying. And it was, I'd say probably three years ago. And it actually didn't stem from a collection list. It, it came from this time-based exchange um, weakness or kind of the way that Microsoft Exchange used to work in querying users. Um, and I was actually doing a penetration test against a large regional bank, and I came across this tool by DAFTAC called MailSniper. And one of the functionalities in MailSniper allowed you to execute essentially brute force attacks against Microsoft Exchange looking for valid usernames, and it was time-based. And so you could give it a list of possible usernames, and it would time the response from the server and there was a, a large um, deviation from the time that it took the server to respond for valid usernames versus invalid usernames. And if you did enough of these, it could kind of start to look at and analyze the time for each and tell you when you had identified valid usernames. And the usernaming convention for this bank um, was first the first initial of the first name and then the last name. And so I essentially created a dictionary of possible you know, common names and things that I had found on LinkedIn and was able to identify, I think, close to 200 valid usernames. And from that, I then started doing, you know, some targeted password guessing and some credential stuffing attacks and was eventually able to compromise several um, valid users and their passwords and was able to take that, log into their exchange and from there, you know, steal some data and get onto their VPN portal and eventually, you know, got internal access and got you know, privileged access and was able to exfiltrate data and prove all these really interesting things. And so how do I go from here to breach credential lists? So I started to think, you know, there's got to be a better way than doing this time-based exchange attack all the time, especially as people are moving to O365 and, and looking at VPN concentrators and Citrix environments. You know, you don't always have the that nice ability to enumerate valid usernames. And so I started to think about all the news articles that I had seen from these collections and realized that I could use those to essentially create a known username list for companies that I was pen testing. And then I could password spray with known bad passwords. We all know users are particularly bad at setting passwords. So I could use things like the season and the year. So winter 2021 or the company name and a number or a set of numbers and using this you know, fairly rudimentary technique, gain access to email, VPN, Citrix, you know, VDI, whatever, um, really more than half of the time. And it's, it's sad to say and sad to see, but it's a very easy and very common attack. So about a year into doing that, something happened and it was during a penetration test and I was helping one of our junior analysts who was running the test and something interesting popped up as he was doing his analysis of the breach credentials list. Um, we had written a number of scripts that would automate much of the querying of the data and then the password spraying, but 
this potential or this uh, person, you know, being so smart and being curious and having that pen tester mindset, um, wanted to do it manually and wanted to see how it all worked. And so he was actually going through and coming through the breach credentials list that we had identified and the usernames and passwords and identified that, you know, half of the passwords for this company all were the same thing. And we started to think about how that might be set. And it, it wasn't a weak password. It was actually a quite good password um, that was 16 characters and had, you know, alphanumeric and special characters. And it, you know, it was very odd to see that many people with that very unique password. And what we identified was there was actually a trend for that organization. They had an IT admin who was setting new users' passwords to this, you know, really good password but he set every person's password to the same thing and didn't require them to reset their password. And so what we ended up with was about half the organization that just stuck with this password because it's what they started with and they thought it was a good password, so they never changed it. And so we were able to compromise you know, a huge swath of people at this organization. Um, and it was really a training issue about you know, how to go about setting unique passwords for individuals and requiring resets. And you know, it really started to be um, kind of the next step in this kind of breach credentials list attack that I was using. So let's talk a bit about how, you know, I've talked about the theory behind it, you know, how I use it um, and, and what some of the things you can do are, you know, but, you know, how do you actually get your hands on these things? Because you can't just, you know, Google, uh, give me breach credentials. You have to kind of know where to look and how to download it. So first things first, you know, where do you search? Uh, so as soon as you see one of these news articles come out about one of these new compilations, the first things that I do are look on torrent sites, things download sites like Mega, and then some common forums. And there's an excellent write-up on threat intel hunting at this getsignal.info site. And I'll have a, a link to this later in the uh, presentation as well. But it talks about both some dark websites and some open or clear websites where you can kind of go onto a forum and search for some of these threads where people share links for breach credential collections. And you can see a few weeks ago, I, I looked here and found um, the comb list as well as the password that was set for the, um, the encrypted file that was containing those sites. So downloading and storage. Um, so I prefer to download either in an EC2 instance in AWS or on a VM you're going on some fairly sketchy forums uh, from time to time, and you're going to be downloading some things that you know could potentially be malicious. So rather than using your actual host, um, I prefer to use a segmented distro like Lubuntu that is lightweight, easily trashed, it has a web browser, um, but you're not you know putting necessarily your your host at risk. Um, I also like to run my VMs on one of these Samsung T5 or T7. Uh, SSDs. And these actually have really good read and write speed and are perfectly fine for running VMs. And the reason I do that um, is because some of these compilations can be absolutely huge. Um, I was running an S3 bucket in AWS not too long ago and had over a terabyte of data of just these flat text files. Um, and part of the reason for that is because these aren't deduplicated. You know, people are just constantly adding things to these lists and no one's going through and curating and making sure that it's you know, unique or even valid and, and size is really the name of the game here. And so having something that you can um, add, you know, add space to add, you know, a large VM to um, and just constantly be adding to is I think really important. A lesson learned for everybody, make sure when you spin up your new VM, you give your VM enough hard drive space to not only download these compressed files, but also expand the files. Um, if I had a nickel for every time I downloaded one of these compilations, uh, and either failed to download or failed when I went to expand because my VM was set to like 50 gig, um, I could retire. I do it literally every time. I did it when preparing for this talk and I will continue to do it every time. Um, but if I can save you that heartache a single time, you know, I hope that helps. So you've gone out to, to a forum, you found the, you know, the link to a torrent site or to a mega download. You've downloaded this and you're storing it on, you know, a Samsung T5 drive or on a VM or EC2, you know, then what do you do? Well, you, you could go to the cloud, like I said, you could store it in EC2 and jam it up into an S3 bucket for easy querying with something like AWS Athena, which makes it very quick. Um, and I've, again, dropped a link here for Fracture Labs, who has a really great tutorial on how to put everything up in uh, S3 and query it with Athena. 
or you can query it directly from that VM, which is quite frankly, the easier route. And so what I've done is dropped in, I'm not gonna do a live demo because I don't wanna tempt the demo gods, but we have some videos here of how you can actually query these breach lists and some of the things that you can see from these. So let's start here. So you can see the folder structure here for the compilation of many breaches. Oop. Um, has a query bash script, which is essentially just a quick bash script to look for a specific name and domain. And that points it to the correct folder. As I said, the folders start with the first initial or the first letter of the, uh, of the email address. And so here I've actually queried for one of my old email addresses. Um, a good point here, one of those things was a valid password that I used about 10 years ago um, before I knew anything about security. One of these is not a password I've ever seen or used before. And I think that just goes to the fact that, you know, some of this data is completely um, random or wrong. It could have been somebody else trying to enter my username and password on a website or brute force it. So you can only trust so much of this data. Um, but, you know, 50%, certainly not bad here, especially for, for pen testing and size is the name of the game. So we're going to try to query as much data as we can. And so this is just one way you can use these files. Um, querying for a very specific username and email. Um, so that'd be great if you're just going to look about, you know, maybe yourself or your friends and family to try to make sure that they're not using a, a password that's weak or still using an old password that's been breached. Um, but as pen testers, we need to go beyond that, right? We can't just query for a single person. Um, it would take all day. So, you know, there's a kind of a better way to query and that is by domain. And so here, We'll do the same thing. We'll go into the data directory of this compilation of many breaches, and we'll just run um, an LS to show the directory structure. And then we'll run just a fairly simple grep. And I'm gonna search for blockbuster.com. Hopefully no one's still working for Blockbuster. And what you'll see is it will iterate through all these files um, and look for usernames that have that at blockbuster.com domain. And you can tell, I mean, this is only been 10 seconds, but it's it's already finding just a huge number of blockbuster.com emails and passwords that have been associated with those. And I won't let this run because it takes, you know, like I said, about five minutes to go through all of these by doing it through this VM. Uh, but you can see here, you know, we, we've got lots of email addresses, lots of passwords that we could potentially try. Um, some of these are, you know, most definitely old, um, but some of these could well be still valid. And if nothing else, you have a starting point for your password spraying attempts because you have a list of usernames. But like I said, um, you can take it a step further. And after I ran this on blockbuster.com, I actually saved everything to a results folder and saved it to a text file. And if we just cat that file, what you can see is there's actually a trend that's emerged here. And you know, this is only the second um, company that I ran this on as I was doing my demo. And you can see Blockbuster 1 appears several times. And so if you go back and, and cat this again and do a grep for just that password, of all the results that we got for Blockbuster, we got you know probably 20 or 30 different usernames that have the password of Blockbuster 1. And you know, could this be coincidence and, and users were just setting bad passwords for their Blockbuster accounts? Sure. Absolutely. Um, but what it could also mean is that there was a, a poor practice by the IT admins or the help desk or you know, maybe even HR for onboarding where they were allowing people to you know, start in the organization with this bad password and keep the bad password um, and not reset it once they started. And so you know, it's unfortunate, but we see this all the time with organizations and you can almost always find a trend like this and if you go back and password guess this password against every user that you find either in a breach credential list or in LinkedIn scraping, um, you know, much of the time you'll be successful in compromising at least one account and getting into something like O365 or a VDI uh, or even VPN. So what's next? So you've analyzed your organization or yourself for your testing targets. You've enumerated a list of possible usernames and passwords, and you've identified, you know, maybe some cool password trends. Maybe it's Blockbuster One. Maybe it's something different. Um, and then, you know, you're going to either conduct credential stuffing or targeted password guessing attacks, which 
is a whole talk in and of itself. So I won't get into those, but there's lots of tools out there to do it, or you could even do it manually. Um, and then, you know, you may run into things like multi-factor authentication. And I've had many clients who have told me that, you know, everything I've talked to about or everything I've talked about up to this point in the presentation doesn't really matter because they've got MFA deployed or multi-factor authentication. And unfortunately, um, that, that it isn't always the case, right? It, either organizations haven't deployed MFA or their MFA is weak. Um, just last week, we had in, you know, a pen test an organization who fell victim to credential stuffing attacks using this exact attack path. And they felt that they were protected because they had MFA. Unfortunately, their multi-factor authentication enrollment portal was facing the internet and they had several users who hadn't yet enrolled. And what that allowed my team to do was simply use the valid username and password that we found, register our phone numbers for that account register our MFA token. And we had a completely valid account and it looked completely valid to the organization because it was tied to a phone. So that's just to say, you know, this is going to continue to be a problem for organizations moving forward. And so, you know, the more we can do to help organizations get better by sharing this knowledge and, you know, demonstrating the ways that password and breach credentials can be used against organizations, I think is really important. Um, so I've dropped some useful resources here. Uh, the first three are things that I talked about during the kind of past few slides. Um, the last one I think is really important. Um, what I've talked about today is really the process by which you can go through and actually collect these types of credentials. There are a lot of tools out there that will automate all of that. There are also third party um, paid providers and some free services that will allow you to directly query these types of breach credentials without actually collecting them. Um, but just like everything else in InfoSec, I think it's so much more meaningful if you go through it the first time and actually manually do some of these steps and manually collect the credentials so that you know where they're coming from, the format they're in, you know, how dirty some of the data can be, and you know, how you can better use it. So you know, I, would, I would advise you, and, and this goes for breach credentials and everything else in InfoSec, before you skip to kind of the easy button, the easy mode, um, and, and run you know, directly into a tool that can automate everything, go through it once and just kind of see how it all works before you go that route. And that way, I think you have a better appreciation for you know, all the work that goes into collecting those and you know, how awful it can be to find some of these trends manually. Cool. So we're gonna switch now to my other passion. So this is uh, bourbon and becoming the whiskey guy. And this is my actual whiskey shelf in my house. I have about a hundred bottles of bourbon right now and I've been collecting for about two years. So we are going to take a, a quick second. And if you do have any bourbon or whiskey or wine or water or coffee, whatever, you know, I'd encourage you to, uh, to pour yourself a glass and maybe, you know, follow along, so. So first things first, um, kind of what is bourbon and how do we understand the whiskeys of the world? Because the bourbon, I think, is really misunderstood, as are many whiskeys. And so I, I have this really great chart that I've shared here, and it outlines the difference between bourbons, Irish whiskeys, Canadian whiskeys, ryes, scotches. You know, there's a lot out there in the whiskey world, and these are all very unique and different. And, and bourbon in particular is uniquely American and has some very strict laws on what makes a bourbon a bourbon um, versus maybe just a, an American whiskey or a scotch. So I wanted to talk just briefly about, you know, what is bourbon and why does it really matter? So bourbon is a barrel aged distilled liquor made from corn. And you'll hear that corn kind of theme continue to pop up. Um, People think that, you know, bourbon is um, American in a lot of ways because it, it is. Bourbon has to be made in America. But it's also, you know, uniquely American because the United States Congress actually passed a bill years ago making, you know, a set of very legal requirements for what bourbon has to be. And it's one of the few things that, you know, in the 1800s had a, you know, the FDA essentially was regulating what could go into bourbon and what couldn't go into bourbon. And so bourbon has to be at least 51% corn. Um, and that mixture of the different grains that go into it is called the mash bill. And we'll talk about that as well. Bourbon must be produced in the US. It must be stored in a charred new oak barrel. 
it must be distilled to no more than 160 proof, which is proof is something we'll talk about as well, which is the percent of alcohol that it is. It must enter the barrel at no more than 125 proof, and it must be bottled at more than 80 proof. And those things are all very important, and we'll talk about why here just shortly. But bourbon is so much more than just those things, and it is for me especially. Um, you know, I talked about collections, and bourbon for me is something to hunt, is something to enjoy and experience, something to relax with, and, and most importantly for me is something to share. Um, my brother, my family, my friends, you know, there's nothing we enjoy quite like sitting down and, and having a glass of bourbon and sharing stories and being together. And, you know, the last year with COVID has, has really accentuated that. And bourbon has been a nice escape, whether it's over Zoom, um, you know, in person in the rare occasion where we can make that happen safely. Um, you know, it's really been kind of that that pressure release valve for me to be able to have a moment and take take time away from the computer and from the zoom meetings uh, and just be with friends and so you know bourbon over the last year has definitely been something that's important to me so why collect bourbon you know right i could just go to the store get a bottle of bourbon drink it for a few weeks uh, when i'm done with it go get another one um, but to me bourbon you know there's some element of the thrill of the chase um, if you've been following bourbon or if you're familiar with whiskey at all in the U.S., there's been this boom over the last 10 years. And what we're seeing is a number of uh, kind of limited releases and, you know, older bourbons and what we call dusty bottles, things that have been on the shelf for years that maybe weren't popular 10 years ago, but are getting popular now. And there's emerged this whole community similar to the InfoSec community that's, that's all about sharing information and sharing reviews and and making bourbon and the community of bourbon bigger. And so Whiskey DFW is a subreddit that I follow. Um, and it's a daily occurrence that you'll see somebody saying something like, who's out hunting today? Or, or sharing where they found a specific bottle that everyone's looking for. And you know what liquor store it's at, who to ask about it, and you know, how many bottles are left at a specific time. And it's become this, you know, kind of this hobby that can really um, grab a hold of you and take a lot of time. And so with that, I'll, I'll you know, issue a caution or a warning. If you're going to get into the bourbon community and you're going to start collecting, be careful. Um, it can get expensive. It can also take a lot of time. There are definitely people out there that spend a good deal of time looking for and buying bourbon. Um, some don't even drink it. You know, there's, there's a secondary market that's emerged where people are reselling some of these bottles, um, even the bottles behind me for you know, 3X or 4X price because people are such um, so interested in buying these rare bourbons. So I'll start with this. You, know, you, you don't have to search high and low or find you know, this rare bottle or a specific type of bourbon to find a great bourbon that you'll enjoy. And so you, know, you go into the liquor store and it can be intimidating if you're not a bourbon person, you're not a whiskey person, you see this wall of 200 bourbons. You know, how do you select one? And so I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about the process that I go through to select a bourbon that's readily available that I think I'll like. Um, and so we'll start with the grain mixtures or the mash bill like I talked about. And the three things you'll start to see the most in that bourbon aisle is, you know, the, the word bourbon, of course, which is because of the corn, a bit sweeter and more caramel-like. It's very smooth, almost a, a dessert drink. You'll also see the term rye thrown around, and that can either be a rye whiskey or a high rye bourbon. And what's that, you know, what that means is there's just more rye in that mash bill, that mixture, um, maybe, you know, close to 50% or even over 50% in a, a true rye. And that rye grain brings out a spicier and more savvy, savory flavor. And if you're not used to drinking bourbon or whiskeys, that can come across as a bit more alcohol forward or hot. And so I, I would, you know, maybe warn you if you're new to bourbon, maybe don't start with a rye, but instead start with something that's a high wheat content because that comes across as more smooth and mellow. And Maker's Mart is a, a great example of a high wheat bourbon that you know, is very easy on the palate, very easy to drink, and obviously readily available. So proof is the next big thing that I think a lot of people make the mistake of when they get into bourbon. Um, the lower proof, and this is alcohol content, 
lower proof is most of the bottles on the shelf. Uh, lower proof is usually between 80 and 90. It's a mellow taste and easy to drink, uh, whether it's neat or on the rocks or you know mixed with whatever you want. It's easy and approachable for a new bourboner. But as you continue down your bourbon journey, and you've started to you know have develop a palate for bourbon and for whiskey, most people find themselves shifting into um, either bottle and bond or barrel proof. And bottle and bond is exactly 100 proof, so it's exactly 50% alcohol. And it legally has to be this way. And the Bottle and Bond Act was something that was passed in the U.S. Um, that, again, put even stricter requirements on what bourbon had to be. And so if you see a bottle, we'll start to pull back here. If you see a bottle like this that actually says Bottle and Bond on it, there are legal mandates on what that means. And so when you, anytime you get a bottle of bourbon that has that bottle and bond labeling on it, you know it has to be exactly 100 proof. And it's, what's gonna come with that 100 proof is a little bit more complexity because it's a little bit less watered down out of the barrel. And that makes it a, a great choice for cocktails without you know losing the complexity when you're mixing it. It also makes for a very great neat drink um, as you're getting more accustomed to drinking whiskey, how to drink whiskey, how to enjoy it, um, and also developing your palate. The next step up from there is what you'll see referred to as either barrel proof or cask strength or full proof. And these are the highest proof bourbons um, out there. And these are often 110 proof. Um, this is 122 proof. These are not significantly watered down after being aged in the barrel. So these come with a ton of flavor, a ton of complexity, but they're not for the faint of heart. So if you're just getting into whiskey or just getting into bourbon, one of the big mistakes I see is people read reviews from people that you know do nothing but drink bourbon and they, they get pointed towards something like a barrel proof or a full proof and they get it. And like the guy in the picture, they're, they're breathing fire and it turns them away from bourbon. And it, you know, it's, it's awful to see because they just picked the wrong thing. Um, and it's not where they should, you know, maybe start, they should start on the lower proof rather than going straight for something that's 60, uh, 60% 60 alcohol. Right. The next thing that you'll see, and this, this comes a lot with that secondary market, is age statements. So this is part of what is so romantic about bourbon and, and why so many people are in love with searching for and finding bourbon. Because bourbon is, in many cases, aged over 10 years. And if you think about you know, the amount of work and the amount of time and thought that goes into that process, it's, it's hard not to fall in love with the idea of bourbon. Um, you can see. Back here, I have a bourbon that you know very clearly says it's been aged for 10 years. And these 10-year whiskeys and older are awfully, often highly sought after just because of the amount of work and passion that's gone into them. I'll warn you, though, some whiskeys are meant to look like they've been aged for a long period of time, but you need to read carefully. A great example is Jack Daniels Old Number 7. You know, a lot of people getting into whiskey think, Old Number 7, right? It has to be aged for seven years. But in reality, you know, that's not the case. It's not an age statement. It's just a number on the bottle. So be very careful as you look um, at bottles and at the age statements. Read carefully on the label because they can't legally say it's an age statement unless it is. So you can start to get a lot of good information by really diving into the details um, of what's on the label. And, you know, again, when in doubt, you can go back to that bottle and bond act. Anything with that bottle and bond label has to legally been aged for at least four years um, or longer. And so you know there's a minimum there. And, and this age, again, adds complexity. So the longer the whiskey has been in the barrel, the more seasons it's gone through and the heating and cold or the heating and cooling of the barrel um, in regions like Kentucky or Tennessee um, expand and contract those barrels and the liquid. Um, and as the liquid soaks into the wood from the barrel and then back out, um, it it just attracts more and more flavor and more complexity. The last thing um, that I'll talk about is batches. And so if you've, if you've been to a liquor store and you've looked at bourbon, you've seen probably um, labels like small batch and single barrel, and it can be confusing, right? I don't, a lot of people don't kind of understand what it all means. And 
many people think that single barrel is always better than small batch. And that's not always the case. It really depends on what you're looking for. And so a small batch is something that comes from a small selection of barrels that are mixed to achieve a consistent flavor. So this Elijah Craig is, you know, just a classic small batch bourbon. And it's one of the most consistent bourbons that I've found. You know, the, the distillers are finding a way to pick specific barrels from their warehouse. And each barrel has a unique flavor because of the location of the warehouse and, you know, the, the way the weather affects that location in the warehouse. And a good distiller is going to find a way to pick barrels from throughout the warehouse and mix them to achieve a consistent flavor. On the other hand, if you get something that's a single barrel, it is, you know, each bottle comes from an individually aged barrel rather than a mix. And so what this allows the distiller to do is to cherry pick or hand pick specific barrels that they feel taste the best and release them for a unique experience. What that also comes with is a different experience for every bottle you get because every bottle might come from a different barrel. And so some of these bottles you can actually see on the label will include the warehouse or the rick house that they were aged in and the location of um, the barrel in that rick house. And so you can start to see even within the exact same bottle that was purchased, you know, a time, you know, six months apart or a year apart, it might have a completely different flavor because of where it was at in the distilling process. And the last thing I'll mention is single barrel select. And this is one of the coolest things I think in bourbon. So a single barrel select is when a group gets to select their own barrel to achieve a specific taste profile. And so typically that's a liquor store that has a whiskey expert that actually gets to work directly with a distiller to taste several different barrels or even request a specific taste um, and gets to decide which barrel that they want to barrel and sell for their customers. And some of these are also done for online communities. And I mentioned, you know, the bourbon community is, is amazing. And there's actually an R bourbon subreddit that has a group of people that are able to select their own single barrel offerings. And so this is an Elijah Craig um, single barrel select offering that was made specifically for the R bourbon subreddit. Um, and I was able to, to pick up a bottle of this and it tastes, I mean, drastically different than these other bottles of Elijah Craig. And again, that's just because of where it was in the warehouse as it was aged, the time it was aged for, um, and the specific seasons during that time period. It may have been super hot or super cold one winter, and that really affects the complexity and the taste of that bourbon. So the last thing we'll talk about is um, how to drink, and that, that's not completely a joke. Um, there's a lot of people that drink bourbon incorrectly, and part of what I see when people are turned away from bourbon is that they don't understand how to correctly sip a bourbon. Instead, they're just trying to chug it um, like they're back in college and uh, trying to just get hammered. And that's, that's not what bourbon's all about, right? Bourbon's about, you know, sipping, enjoying the complexity, enjoying the drink and, you know, being able to sit and enjoy it together um, with, with people. So, um, you know, there are lots of different glasses, you can get uh, these, these small sipping glasses, some that are a little bit larger, um, that are meant really to um, help with the, the aroma of the bourbon and help as you're drinking to really share that aroma. Um, I prefer just a good old highball glass. Um, I don't put a ton in there, but you know, you're, you're supposed to really take small sips and not guzzle the thing down. So in summary, you know, whether it's breach credentials, bourbon, whiskey, scotch, Pokemon cards, whatever it is, you know, find something you enjoy and dive in. And that's something I've really stressed to the people that work with me um, or people that come to me and are asking to get into penetration testing or security is, you know, you can't, um, you can't make progress if you're just thinking about the best first step you know, just find something you enjoy doing and just dive right in. And whether it's, you know, credentials, bourbon, you know, take the first step. And even if you end up, you know, in a year realizing that you've been moving in the wrong direction, at least you've been moving. And so,
you know, that's the one piece of advice I'd give anyone starting out is just, you know, start moving. I think we have a few minutes for questions if there's any, and if you don't mind, yeah, I'm gonna you have some take questions. a drink. Yeah, oh, take sweet. a drink and I'll, I'll queue up your questions. All right, so the first one, um, is there any legal concern and you know you can make this country specific if you want uh, with collecting stolen credentials, providing you don't use them without authorization. You know, I I wish I knew the answer to that. I'm certainly not a lawyer, so yeah. um, not that I'm aware of. Um, these are all things that are publicly available and out on the internet. And assuming that you're not using them for malintent, you know, I, I would think that it was probably okay. But again, I'm not a lawyer. Yeah. We are, neither of us is a lawyer. <laughs> we don't play one on TV. So yeah. Yeah. Um, the next question is about bourbon and whiskey. In the whiskey community, there's often a disgust for bourbon. I don't understand this. Do you have any insight to why that is? I didn't know there was such a disgust for bourbon. Um, this is news to me. I'm devastated. Me too. Is that the international whiskey community? Because I could see that. Yeah, maybe the maybe the question asker will clarify this. Um, yeah, the next question is very specific. So I don't know if you're going to have a guess at this one. Um, are there any credential dumps you you know of available of pin numbers from the Asia re region? Asking because that there's a research project ongoing. <laughs> I would have to do some research. I would, I would definitely point you back to that blog post that I shared around the threat intelligence hunting. Um, just about everything that I've ever sought to research, I've been able to find a good thread through one of those kind of platforms. There's always someone that's kind of looking at the same thing as you, even if it's not for the same purpose. You know, there, there's so much good information out there that I would point you back to that link and to that threat intel hunting. Awesome. Uh, your, your commenter about the whiskey versus bourbon thing has mentioned that that is an international non-US thing. So um, might, yeah. might be something not visible to us in the United States. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's that's, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, interesting. You'll have to you'll have to explain to me after and definitely yeah, the chat will still be running. That. So if people want to ask you more questions, are, um, are there any more questions? I don't see any more in the chat. There's a, there's 11 people typing right now. So uh -oh. they might be debating about bourbon versus whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> it just says several people are typing now. Yeah. And, and I can see the oh. international part, right? Because it's, you know, the U S is a younger place and whiskey bourbon in particular is much newer than things like scotch. So I can definitely see that it's just doesn't have the, the international following. Okay. A couple more questions. So uh, do you have a personal favorite right now, bourbon? I, I do. Um, so I don't have it with me. I got so many favorites. So I actually just found a new one and I, I am out of it. So uh, a very affordable and easy to find bourbon uh, is from Redwood Empire. And I'll paste a link in the chat later. They also have a mix of bourbon and rye. Um, that is amazing. And the labels on them are really, really cool. It's some awesome artwork. Um, but it's what I've been going to as kind of my easy, you know, daily drinker that you can always find in the liquor store. So I'll, I'll post a link for that. Cool. And I think one, we've got time for one last question. Do you put together breach credentials in your own personal database for, for quick searches? And how do you do that? Yeah. So I, I posted a link to a um, tutorial about how to move everything to the cloud. We didn't have time to get into it, but that's actually what I've done is I've started collecting all these breach uh, compilations and pushing them all to S3. And you actually don't push them to a traditional database because it's it's very um, kind of dirty data. The formatting is not perfect, but you there's a way to use S3 as essentially an unrelational database um, and query it directly with AWS Athena. And that, that link that I posted, and I'll post it in the chat as well, has a really good tutorial on how to do that. And it also saves a lot of money because like I said, the size of these can get really unwieldy. I think I have a terabyte or two terabytes up there right now. Um, and the, the querying could also take a long time. So I'm able to get through that query in about, I think, four minutes, even running it through, you know, over a terabyte. 
Awesome. Well, thanks for sharing both of your very interesting talks with us today. We can see from the chat that people are very engaged and have a lot more comments and discussion they want to have with you. So thank you again for your time and for being part of the conference today. Thanks, everyone.